Namaste and in la cats and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host Zen Benefiel and I'm not going to tell you what Namaste and in la catch means. I'm going to have you look into the past shows and find out for yourself. However, I will tell you it will make one huge difference in your life when you start applying that theory and concept in your life and those around yours. Don't believe me? Test it for yourself. Great. So this week's guest is Hank Dearden. He is the executive director of Forest Planet. He is also the principal of Group 3D. Now that sounds interesting. And he was the security, or I'm sorry, the senior director of operations for Trees for the Future. He's a graduate of Dartmouth College in engineering from the Thayer School of Engineering. Uh, he's also uh, graduated from Vassar College you know, with a mathematics and engineering degree as well. So this is a smart guy. Um, he says he studied electronics, materials, and managerial economics, but focused on systems theory. And Professor Dave, uh, Dana and Dennis Meadows, authors of Limits to Growth. So we're going to talk about that for a little bit today, I'm sure. Hank, glad to have you here. Thank you so much for having, uh, having me. I'm glad to be here. It's going to be an interesting conversation, especially with the work that you're doing and how connected it is to life on planet Earth. Um, even though I'm sitting on the moon and we're talking about Earth in the background. Yeah. And so we're going to bridge that in this conversation. <laughs> sure. So, you know, uh, what I talk to people about are the, the ways in which they got in touch with the their inner drive in life could come from all kinds of different realms. Um, a lot of people think it's spiritual, some think it's religious, and some just that's who they are, right? And I think you're kind of one of those guys. How did you initially uh, get in touch with your direction as a kid and uh, the fascination with the planet that you obviously have? Um, I, I guess it's two things. Um... I, I can't really say I had a, uh, you know, a, a naturalist uh, upbringing. It was a typical Midwestern kid, you know, happy, you know, blue jeans running around and rooting for Ohio State like everybody else did. Yeah, you're and, my neighbor. There I'm, you a are. I'm a Hoosier from way back. There you go. So Buckeyes Hoosiers. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, so I, I can't really sort of point to anything there. Um, I, I guess I always had this sort of like a, a predilection for for math and for engineering for you know the corporal world and you know getting things to work in harmony I like the harmony and and you know engineering is all about you know, using natural forces as best as possible to get the bridge to sand up to get something to work how does how does the how do the electrons want to flow out in your, your electric circuit so that's all that um, uh, the, well, that, doesn't that kind of lead you into questioning, okay, how, on a deeper level, how do things really work and, and what are the constructs there? And, and I totally agree with you that engineering kind of takes you that direction. I, I spent a lot of years as a pre-construction partnering facilitator for building road and bridge construction projects. Okay. So yeah, sure. I get that. And, and I uh, spent a lot of time in the aerospace industry as well. So I understand the engineering side of things. And yet here we are. How do we apply that, you know, toward our planet? Yes. Well, that's that's um, exactly what I was uh, studying at Dartmouth um, and, uh, and and Vassar, by the way. Uh, you know, math and liberal arts and people and the history of the planet and art and all that kind of stuff. So, try mm -hmm. to be a Renaissance man. Try to be. Um, but well, according to Yoda, you either do or do not. There do is or do no not. Try. <laughs> there is no try. Uh, do or not do. Yes, sir. So yes, poof, I'm a Renaissance man. There you have yeah, it. Okay, okay. good, good. Issue Claim solved. It. Next question. All right. um, uh, but then there was also maybe like a practical awareness that kind of hit me, at, or maybe I always had it, that it's a small planet, you know, and we have to take care of it. And, you know, people talk about outer space. And when I remember when I was a kid, when, you know, when men walked on the moon and how like, awestruck everything, everyone was and how about all that. And I'm like, and I was too. This is really cool. It's really amazing. Everybody wants to be an astronaut. 
But if you just sort of look at, the, okay, so what does that involve? Well, we're going to have to take all this stuff. we got to plan on, you know, fly long distances to a place that's got no air, no water, no nothing. And then just a simple question came in my mind, like, why? You know, mm -hmm. what's, what's, you know, what's, what's on the moon that we don't have, what's on Mars that we don't have. And it, it just, it sort of, it sort of came back that, you know, we just have to, it's just a practical necessity that thou shalt not, you know, uh, mess with your nest. <laughs> well, and, and that you know? was an engineering feat, right? Just to be able to do that, get people there alive. Yeah, no, it's an amazing thing. It, it, right. it, it really is an incredible thing. But then it begs the question of why. And, you know, there's, I don't want to get into that too much. And I'm not going to sit here and trash talk NASA or any of that stuff. But well, you I know, will. I, NASA, it, it, yeah, it's got some questionable things. However, I had the opportunity to uh, talk to Edgar Mitchell. I met him, became friends with him. Um, amazing man. And, and he took that journey uh, to great lengths in, in coming back and studying consciousness and, and how that all works in relationships yeah. to how we live here on earth yeah no it, it's it's um uh, it, it's uh it's 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 just a it's just a challenge we have and it's a reality we have mm -hmm. you know you have to take take care of our itty bitty blue marble suspended as it is in a vast void of pitiless right. empty nothingness so um yeah that's sort of in the back of my mind and um well, where did the curiosity take you initially? You got your degrees and you were in that mm, thoughtmosphere, for lack of a better. And it intrinsically, you know, the practical side of things, the curiosity that you developed from it, how did that begin to impact your uh, life path, let's say, the, the direction you were desiring to go with it? So the, the good thing about uh, Dartmouth at the time is that they had a pretty strong program in systems theory, and that was the application of uh, engineering mindset, you know, thought, pro thought processes and uh, problem-solving methodologies, but applied to not necessarily engineering situations. Mm -hmm. Like, so we were building, and then we used computer models to sort of keep track of all the variables and all the interconnectedness of the levels and the rates of the whatever system that you were looking at. So sure. it really taught you about systems analysis. Early modeling. Yeah. Um, so they built a very, you know, a hack a computer model program called Dynamo, which was a core hog. And it was just a whole bunch of parallel, uh, uh, parallel equations. But uh, it worked because it sort of really sort of forced you to really sort of understand the pieces and recognizing that many times that, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, but you got to start with the sum of the parts. You know, you really oh, right, need to sort of right. understand the parts. So we would build simulation models of cities. You know, why are some cities have urban decay and some don't? How come they survived? People were building simulation models of soil. Okay, so soil is a living dynamic thing. It has lots of dynamics going on. There are layers of it. There's water. There's microbial activity. There's, you know, the fungi. All that kind of stuff happens. Yeah, the mycelium. Mycelium, it's all in there. There's CO2 being absorbed. There's O2 being excreted, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot going on, and it's complicated, right? Um, we built models of anorexia nervosa, uh, of alcoholism. What are the mechanics in the human psyche that lead to those, frankly, uh, pathological behaviors? Mm -hmm. and I will call them such. Um, and so... Uh, the point was, is that, okay, when you looked at something that was sort of seemingly big and, and complicated and rather being being overwhelmed by the enormity of it, uh, you had a systemic approach. Okay, let's take it piece by piece and put it together such that you can understand how this dynamic, this interacts with this, this interacts with it, and put it all together. And then the model just keeps track of all your observations, okay? It mm -hmm. is not, you know reducing reality to, you know, a, a, you know, a, a cold, a heartless line of code or two, you know. Right. It's, well, it sounds from what you're saying, it allows you to take a look from a bigger picture of how yes, the synergistically, how the parts fit and exactly. work together. Exactly. And keep okay. track of it because right. I mean, your, your brain only keeps track of so many things at one time and the brain is, is amazing as it is, and it's my brain saying that, uh, second and third order and fourth order uh, feedback loops are, are, are hard to spot. 
they're just hard to spot, but they're well, very it's like real. the third and fourth standard deviations, right? Yes. And, you know, and how they interact with the fifth order, you know, something else. Right. And it, 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 the world, the, the point is, is that the world is not simply a linear thing. You know, the universe, the world, the earth that we live in, whatever, it's not a simple, you no, know. It's very nonlinear and sometimes, uh, you know, in regard to the mind, non-local even. Exactly. It's so, you, and, 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 and even in there, I mean, with engineering, you're talking, you have to sort of get into the imaginary space, literally. Mm -hmm. Like, like the square root of negative one or I or J has to be put into your equations to figure out how the circuit works. And it's, they don't really even understand why that is. Okay. So we have to go to the imaginary plane to do this calculation, but then we come out of it at the end and it worked. We don't right, know right. why. Right. Right. We and don't know just why. like the, what is it? The, uh, the variable to, for the equation that allows carbon to exist, right? The, the 32 decimal places. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's right. there's, there's lots of stuff. I mean, look, how do we just, figure that out? <laughs> look, how, how, just the square root of negative two is a number that goes for infinity. It just right. falls between the cracks, so to speak. Pi falls between the cracks. So oh, pi goes in the gut. Right. It, 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 yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Through the cracks into the gut. So right, right, right. <laughs> especially pumpkin. Um, so that's, uh, it, it was just interesting to sort of, have that education early and then really have a systemic mindset. Now that my career took me into business development and marketing. The great thing about going to engineering school early was that I wasn't a great engineer. I wasn't, I mean, I enjoyed it. I thought it was cool. Um, but there was but something more that just didn't catch your passion. Two things. A, there was something more and B, I just, it, I, I didn't get it a lot of times and okay. I, I, I sort of hacked my way through, but I respected it and I respected it as a tool, as an interesting the technology as a tool. And I respect the people that sort of dedicate their lives and who do these type of work, because it is pretty amazing about all the things that have oh, to come absolutely. together to create a computer. I mean, you've got a whole new set of mathematics, Boolean logic, plus, you know, materials, plus, you know, electronics, plus all this kind of stuff. And, and you know, at the end of the day, boom, you've got like a smartphone all the different things that go into that phone are just pretty freaking amazing that a lot of people maybe don't because they just push one or two, three buttons and they talk to someone and they don't think about it. Right. And, it, and right now we are carrying not a supercomputer, but definitely a computer in the hands where yeah. it used to take up a room, you know, 30 years ago. Sir. Yes, sir. So that was engineering that sort of brought that all down together plus science. So I appreciate that. Um, now, in terms of spiritually, or, or sorry, or personally, the, um, you know, career path, you know, I'm sure I was working for an electronics firm that made really cool stuff and other people that were doing speech recognition in the early 90s, which was very cool. And then the internet came along and I sort of jumped on that. So, you know, a lot of, you know, bouncing around, if you will. Um, but I guess it, it dawned on me sort of late, but hopefully not too late, that, you know, there are different types of people in the world where they get their... Um, sense of fulfillment mm -hmm. okay and uh there are most people in the world do not expect or demand fulfillment from their job because they are doing good work necessary work filling out loan documents working at the the, uh, the dmv repairing the buses doing all this stuff it's all necessary and you know you have to have it I'm grateful for it. And then by no way am I going to, am I saying this to diminish, you know, the, their livelihood, but I will. Well, yeah. There, all these things need to happen in order for to us happen. to have a and life on earth. Yeah. And it's necessary. And I would speculate that they get their fulfillment from other places, their family, their mm -hmm. religion, their friends, um, their, their hobbies were somewhere else. Um, I don't believe that people are personally fulfilled working at the dry cleaners. No, no. Um, but there are those <laughs> occasions where everything aligns. And uh, I kind of refer to it as, a, uh, engineeringly speaking, a perfected form, fit, and function in the world. Could be. All of those things line up and we strive for that. It's like the question is, what's fulfilling to me instead uh, of you know, how can I fit and earn a living so that I can do other things that are fulfilling? Correct. So, um, and again, there's no judgment here. It was just an no, none. 
it's just how it is right and i felt that i guess i had to get fulfillment out of my job and i did see a venn diagram recently you know it's again you know back to engineering right you know four circles and then where you want to be is in the middle is the intersect of the four circles and the four circles are you're good at it it's needed you like it and you can earn a living right uh, I'm right now at 3.2 of those. So if I work harder, I can earn more of a li living at doing Forest Planet where, yes, I like it. Well, yes, speaking like of it. engineering, is it working harder or working smarter? It's all the above. You know, <laughs> smarter, harder, or, you know, harder at finding the right thing. Yeah, well, sometimes then, it's hard to work smart. Right, and then you look like you're smart. You're like, no, no, I just very, very quickly worked through 99 things that didn't work. And to yeah. get to the hundredth that did. Oh, he's smart. Oh no, he just I was like, what is it? Thomas Edison said that. I was uh, just gonna say, yeah. That, yeah, genius is what five percent inspiration and ninety-five percent perspiration, or some yeah. some 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 ratio and, like that. And he didn't figure out, you know, it wasn't ninety-nine mistakes. It was just ninety-nine ways to not make a light bulb. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, and and then it did, it did kind of all click to me um, when I met these folks. Uh, it was almost well, it was 20 years ago about from a small NGO here in Washington, D.C. called Trees for the Future. And I thought they were just planting trees in the local Silver Spring, D.C. area. And that's nice. But so, well, we planted millions of trees around the world. It's about whole societal transformation. And I was like, what? And then he started talking. And I realized that's system dynamics. That's exactly yeah. what I was talking. I studied. I go, look, I studied this thing. 30 years ago i get it what you're doing i think it's great um uh and then then what uh followed was a, a, an interesting back and forth with that particular organization that spanned uh maybe 15 years where i was a vendor then i wasn't and then there was a kerfluffle and then i was a board member and then i wasn't there was a kerfluffle and then, then i was an employee and then i wasn't there was i mean it was just so maybe it, it was some kind of just loggerheads and I could, you know, pontificate well, on that. It sounds like an interesting dance where maybe you were, you know, listening to jazz and, and uh, classical was playing for a while. It could have been, or I think it was more that, look, these guys were muddling along for 25 years at maybe a million or $2 million a year, getting the trees planted, doing a job, but their program could have scaled to 100 million trees and the planet needs 100 million trees so mm -hmm. guys why don't we kind of like stop sort of horsing around here and tighten yeah, you up need to be able to scale and scale which means business processes which means your crm and all that kind of stuff well i i i was the guy who was just like who had just marched in on the carpet with with muddy shoes just to even talk about that stuff and then ironically is, is that they were getting 80 percent eight zero percent of their money from businesses and I'm like, well, maybe why don't we take the page from that and sort of run this like a business and then you get that pushback. So, well, we're not a business, we're a mission-based organization. And I go, but you get a paycheck. So, I mean, right away, it's just, you know, you're- No, perception. So this brings up a really interesting, and I find this often, yeah. right? Yeah. That um, people in, in places like that, NGOs, NPOs, um, they don't see themselves as a business no. and- oftentimes have too many kerfuffles yes. that don't allow them to really have the efficiency and the reach and, and the dynamic of the or organization that they could really have if they would just shift their perspective slightly. And, and, right? and to them, businesses are big, soulless things that pollute and exploit. And there's plenty of evidence to that point. Absolutely. But, but and you know, granted, planted and i'm not saying here you know business is great you know but I'm, i am going to say that it's the process so sure. maybe the processes should, evolve right right processes evolve it's the engineering mindset process you know how can we leverage this how can we get raise the additional funds which are necessary like it or not to get from planting 20 million trees a year to planting 2 million trees a year Right. Like two and then you got to get really clear on your mission, your vision, your value proposition, and all those kinds of things, which are all part of business development. Right. And the good news is that that was all kind of pretty tight. They had a great mission. They mm -hmm. had a good value proposition. They had a great story. 
they had a great story and it was just sort of sitting there not being told and that's 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 the part that drove me nuts so anyway um september 11 2015 my mom's birthday um i found myself blinking on the curb saying listen you know you're, you're, you're no longer needed you know goodbye you know here's the door and I sort of had poured my heart and soul into that organization. I was effectively COO at the time. And, you know, the first thing you do in something like that is you just go to Ireland and go biking, <laughs> of course, as one does, right? And sort of clear yeah. your head and do a little genealogical research and just sort of get the heck out. And like, you know, it's like, what yeah, the heck? rest your brain for a while, get involved in something that's a little creative and exploratory in a different way. Exactly. So sort of clear the head and that, you know, another transfer, big transformation I'd had re uh, earlier in my career. The first thing I did is I went to Wales and I went biking. So like, okay, well, next will be Scotland. So um, hopefully there won't be a day. I'll just go on my own. But I, you know, I came back thinking that I really love the mission. I, you know, I really love what's going on because trees, we haven't really talked about too much. Uh, we can get into that in more detail. They are a great machine for restoring the land for restoring communities at multiple level and it's not just about uh, sequestering carbon which is very real and, and very true but a lot of times it's about making land arable again by hanging on to water changing channeling water into aquifers you know the basic things of our our species that kind of need i mean no water no life right you know? and, and the ways in which they do that we're kind of bereft of understanding of the integrated networks that are underground Correct. Like we mentioned earlier the, the mycelium uh, and the interconnectedness uh, of trees talking to each other, yes. vegetation talking to each other in a language we don't understand. And yet it's obvious that they are because of how they're developing. And once we get underground and we start looking at the structure of it, yes. oh my gosh, there is a lot of things there that often look like the brain. Yeah, totally. Yeah, oh, it, it, totally. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot of communications going along. Um, but then there's are things that we do understand, like, you know, mm -hmm. gravity, that if the trees are there and the roots are tunneling in the holes, water will be absorbed. That's easy. And, and, and the gravity of our situation today is that we <laughs> haven't been paying attention to this. The gravity. So, um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's something that I was pretty excited about. And then, and then all of a sudden it was taken away. And then, um, as they say, don't curse the darkness, light your own candle. But even though that, I, I, a bunch of friends were telling me, Hank, uh, you, you start your own. You were effectively COO of that other organization. You understand the communication. You understand where the money came from. You understand how to spend it properly. Um, start your own organization. I said, well, I can't really do that because I personally do not have the experience of working in the field with uh, a nursery and getting tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of seedlings planted it with appropriate species in the appropriate place at the appropriate time. I am not that person. However, you do have an understanding of the system and the process of uncovering what that is. Yes. And recognizing when other people do know what they're talking about. Right. And that's part of the system. So um, what they said is, is that, listen, you know, you don't really have to have that infrastructure in-house, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You can sub it out. You've got connections. You know there are groups around the world that no one's ever heard of that are below the radar because 99% of their time is spent actually doing the work in a developing country. They've got no marketing. They've got no yeah. ad chops. Got Wouldn't no it be marketing. interesting if we could divert all of this advertising, you know, BS money that, that's supporting a, a narrative of still consumerism and redirect that kind of like a defense budget, right? <laughs> if we could redirect that towards these things, man, things would change overnight. That is kind of, you put the, you put your finger on the, uh, you put your finger on the button here. That's kind of what forced. Oh, sitting on the moon, you can see those things. Yeah, you see it from your Olympian remove <laughs> as you are. So I started Forest Planet. Uh, I have my own brand. I have my own board. I have my own, you know, set of way I do things. And, you know, the first thing I did was start with a CRM, just contacts management, because that's really what we're going to be doing. Sure. And then making good friends and traveling to California and these other places to talk to these organizations that already have program, that already, they just need more money. It's that simple. Right. Uh, they've got a great story and it needs to be told and I'm the amplifier.
on the megaphone. Fine. Um, so the business model is kind of simple. I sell low uh, and buy slightly lower. So the price to uh, brands, businesses, who wish to sort of uh, embrace to some degree a sustainable message to the extent that they can, mm -hmm. or at least in parallel with it, whatever it is that they're doing. And I've got plenty of examples. Um, it's an affordable way, because that's the case, crazy thing. It's affordable to save our planet. You know, it's an affordable thing. Never mind, of course, necessary. It's it's not. It's an affordable thing, and it's fast, and it works, and it's easily communicated when you're talking about forest restoration in these communities, because again, it's about the water, and it's about the soil. Uh, it's about income security and food security for people who are actually quite desperate. Around. Right, especially in places where poverty is rampant. Yes, sir. You know, most of that is because of food shortage shortages. Right, and short term and short term agricultural things where it was not sustainable, and it's a downward cycle. People will do things that were not sustainable in the short term because they're desperate, mm -hmm. you know, knowingly so. Sure. But, you know, well, and, you, and that's how we think short we term, do. right? Yeah, we do. We, I fix today what the, you know or tomorrow what you need today um that was probably not the best way to put it but yeah we don't have a long-term vision we've got the short term it's like uh and our whole society is that way it seems you know it's like muck enlightenment we do you know, go through the drive through and pick it up you know it, you know and, and sometimes human beings have demonstrated long-term vision and they've done either good or bad jobs or at least they've sort of backed off it and usually it's like you have room to do that when you don't have immediate crisis right right and, um, and also you're not you're, you're still under the radar right because you see these things that need to be done and you figure out a way to do it without even you want to attract attention but unfortunately oftentimes you don't it's just the matter of the people that you can connect with and the networks you can create yep. that get the job done in spite of everything else correct so and in those networks uh is pretty much what forest planet is on the spider in the middle um we, now, we're, how, we're, how do you see these networks you know part of what i i'm really curious and i think many are are is how do these connections these networks these uh building blocks so to speak what are the core competencies of this activity that promotes this uh advanced movement if you will that redirects the attention back to the basics of life uh, i don't i don't i'm not sure that that's a sort of a bigger question that i can answer um, well, in your experience, uh, if you could, and I know you probably haven't been asked this question uh, because it, it hadn't been necessary, but from an outsider standpoint who wants to understand how these systems work and the things that can be put into place and actualized in order for it to grow, yep. this is not just your, you know, this is ubiquitous, this is systems, right? And, you know, like Dr. Laszlo talks about the, the higher self being the the core of the systems thinking and, and he's kind of the grandfather of quantum thinking systems wise here we're talking on a much more practical level how do you take that higher self and put it into what works for everybody and in, into re restoring life that we've been rather negligent toward oh totally so um Again, I'm not sure how to answer that I, 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 other than I just sort of look at what needs to happen. Um, you know, my, my system is a connection machine, if you will. Forest plan is a connection machine. And the connection is between, uh, quite frankly, Western dollars and resources, which go very far in the developing worlds. It's that simple. And where a dollar, I mean, I was just in Tanzania in, in June seeing uh, four uh, tree planting sites that we, we, we uh, funded mm -hmm. at 400,000 trees plus across all of them, or maybe five, it was a lot. Uh, and it was pretty amazing. Um, and it was a pretty amazing working uh, with the, you know, uh, being there with the people that, that I subcontract out to, because there is a wonderful group there. It's called the Friends of Usambara Society, homegrown mm -hmm. group. It's right. in the Usambara. We should connect further on that. We uh, live and let live uh, being the executive director we have a small group of people in 
Tanzania. Oh. How they pronounce it. We Westerners, we Tanzania, right? Because that's how phonetically it looks. But they, they pronounce it Tanzania. But those kinds of things, I agree. Now, how um, how do the cultures fit? Because one of the things in the 80s is Westerners and, and especially uh, American companies went abroad. 80% yep. of them failed because they didn't study the culture they were going into first and they expected everybody to operate the way they did. Yep. So well, it, it, it's what's been done to, to alleviate that? So, well, so, so first, in, 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 these guys, I've like, I think a little more global awareness because number one, uh, there, there's two things to that. Number one, I do, I'm not going in there. They're already there. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, um, they have a tourist organization. So they are already reaching out to people in Europe and around the world. Come visit the Usambara Mountains. They're not far from uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. It's a gorgeous place. Uh, yes. Lots of different places to stay. It's absolutely beautiful. And then they also have a place in a guest house right on Pangani um, a River, the town, little fishing town right on the Indian Ocean, which is also incredibly beautiful, where a lot of people think is the, the birthplace of Swahili. That's a separate interesting story mm, so, so they already are, are good communicators and realize that they need to talk to different people and different people come to them and and whatever and so that's great but then i think and realize is that listen a this is our home and we're seeing what's happened the trees are getting cut down there's encroachment into the forest there's poverty there's all these things we need to put the trees back for all kinds of reasons so maybe i'm not sure which came first or they came together their own kind of you know journey and path was to said yeah we're a tourist organization masquerading as an environmental or vice versa i don't know i don't care um that they're both here. kind of merge yeah they kind of brought it all together so they have uh, already kind of like a uh, you know a sense of awareness outside their little mountain town of lesotho um now again back to but my model is is that I first recognize that I'm absolutely not an expert at this. And that's, I think the first thing is, you know, know thyself and know thy place. Right. And to research, and ask good questions, ask good questions. So if someone claims to be an expert, I'm, you know, I, I nod my head, you know, nicely and sagely, but then I, I, bet, I ask a bunch of questions and they better answer them coherently because, you know, a good thing about education and life and gray hair is that you start to, you know, separate the BS. Right, so right. These guys it really makes sense. Now, this is one thing, the separating the BS. Uh, I was listening to an interview with uh, Matthias uh, DeMott with um, Tucker Carlson, of all people, and he was talking about the uh, what we haven't been seeking, he calls empathic resonance, right? right. And that, when I heard that, it's like, Wow, yeah, because if you're looking for anything else, if something doesn't resonate, and especially if you're sharing it between people, that's an empathy, right? So if you don't have this shared resonance, then mm -hmm. you got to figure out what's getting in the way. Yeah. And it sounds like this is kind of what the process that you're doing and, and relying on the indigenous folks. And, and I find that, and maybe you do too, let me ask you this, do you see a, a huge difference in the way um, Americans who really don't have an, uh, an old culture haven't really paid attention to what indigenous cultures elsewhere, the wisdom that they have, and then how to incorporate that in the overall scheme of things. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to answer that. I do find it very interesting that way too many people in our country here um, have spent their whole life within 20 miles of where they were born. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that's, and they were able to do like a study on just, you know, how these people vote and how these people behave. And I'll let you draw the conclusions of like just what they're doing. And just, there's a sort of sense of, you know, xenophobia out there. And, you know, I, I don't know who was it. It was uh, Mark Twain. that said, you know, the best cure for, you know, a lot of things is travel, uh, you know, Put your own, you know, absolutely uh, get out, go someplace, social structures and everything, and in, into perspective. Well, and um, you also by going places, you step into the unknown, right? No, you step I, out of the familiar. Yeah, you know, yes and no, yes and no, because okay. sure, yeah, I, you know, I got on a plane and we flew to Turkey and we got there and we spent eight hours and then we flew down to Dar es Salaam and then they drove all the way up, and you know what? Everywhere you go. 
it's norm wherever you are is normal for the people who are there because usually they have like a day-to-day -day thing they do they get the kids up they get them to school they they want they, they wash their clothes they they make the food they go to the work they do whatever and i just described everybody pretty much right mm -hmm. and you don't want to get too caught up in the specifics. Okay, when I got there, it did not blow my mind that they drove on the left. Well, because of former British colony. Right. You know, it, it was interesting about the, you know, the, the, the police, how they sort of dealt with things. Um, uh, the roads, the infrastructure, and what they thought was important and what they thought was, oh, well, that's just the way it is. But everyone everywhere has that kind of like um maybe they're kind of inured to things that other people would find outrageous uh, because maybe they are they're just kind of used to it i mean the roads over there were just outrageous they put all our hotel was at the top of we had to get a four-wheel drive truck to drive to the hotel so who puts a hotel on a road that's completely impassable right and you know i think that's crazy but then they throw it over the united states it's like well, you've got so many oh, guns. Great for the four-wheel drive sales. Huh? Good for them. But, you know, you, you're shooting people all over and that's insane. And then there's too many people in this country who say, well, that's just the way it is. So that kind of, one of the things I've noticed is that, you know, provincialism is universal. And it doesn't take too much open-mindedness when you get to wherever you are to just sort of sit back and observe. And I usually just go to a grocery store because that kind of tells you everything. You know, show me where you buy your food. You know, there's all kinds of, you know, just human activities. And there's right. universals to this. And that's actually the whole point of a system theory as well, is how to tap in and identify the universals that um, just sort of rule everything. Now, so, do, you, do you see this? The, let me ask you a question so that we are on the same page. How do you understand provincialism? Uh, people, provincialism, like, look, I used to live in Boston. Okay. okay. Here's a perfect example. The nickname of the Boston, do you know what the nickname of the Boston is? Uh, they call there, themselves? I do not. Okay, so like New York's the Big Apple, right? Yeah. Boston's the hub. Okay. Right? Well, guess what that's short for? The hub of the universe. Oh. That's the nickname of Boston. I loved my time in Boston. I love New England. My family's from there. That's a little outrageous go, now, isn't it? I go, guys really the whole universe i mean you have a lovely town here everything's fine you know red Sox, whatever clam chowder wonderful beaches yeah go down the list you got all this kind of stuff what wh why what do you gain from that kind of like uh, we're the center of the, the we're the hub of the universe but that we all love I'm, labels right and the more outlandish they can be the more attractive they seem maybe it is but it's but but that kind of provincial attitude is replicated all around the planet okay it's would that go months. along with colonialism i don't know I, I you know i just think it's like people like their homes yes you know, like people I, they, like, do, they do and yes. yet others in larger sectors like their homes too in a different kind of way in you know bringing them under management control as opposed to um ancillary or rogue uh, uh, you know element Look, that... and i could bring it back to the other comment i made earlier and i think it's still so of a, of a uh, there's a connection here and this is this is a true story um and it gets back to the creation of swahili uh-huh okay so uh back in the i think it was the eighth or ninth century uh arabs were coming down the coast because the the trade winds were were unbelievably predictable six months north, six months south, and they could make a trip. They could bring their goods, their, their, their spices, their silks or whatever, and head down the coast and they could pick up ivory gold and hate to say it, slaves. Yes, they were doing that. So they would do that all that time. And they would trade with all the people. How we treat there. each other. It was horrible. I mean, that's a whole separate discussion. Yeah. But what they would do is they would go all the way down the East Coast of Africa and every town had a different language. We're talking separated sometimes by 10 miles. No written language, but even spoken language. Mm -hmm. And the Arabs were just like, guys, can, tell Consistency, what, please. Right? <laughs> can we get together? And that's what happened. They brought multiple tribes 
around the little town of Pangani, not too far from Zanzibar, and said, okay, can we all agree on the word for water is whatever the word for water is? And can we, can we all agree on that? Because here's, here's what happens. If we all do this, we, the Arabs, will trade more with you. You will become wealthy if you can all speak one language together. And they got the memo, and that's how Swahili, that's why there's a lot of Arabic words in Swahili, mm. right? So sure. like the, the, Arab word, the Arab word for travel is safar. Well, Swahili, it's safari, which is now the English word. Right. So that's how I found this to, to us. But I guess my point is about provincialism is, is that it really took like an extra force outside and with a big incentive to get people Business. to realize to that, like, you know, maybe we should give up, maybe our language isn't the best, or maybe we should, you know, to get along with other people, we should, you know, because every single one of them, uh, I would, I would submit saying, well, why can't everybody just speak our language? What's wrong with you? And these are little towns in East Africa. So, um, and, and, and I, again, expectations no are high, right? It's, it's like, why can't these people, you know, we think it's so easy. Well, my wife's Russian. Exactly. Right? And she speaks four languages and, and two of three of them fluently, and that's English, Russian, and music. There you um, go. And yet there's, you know, so many, I have another friend who speaks six languages. I am just amazed at how that developed. I feel, you know, little in their presence because of that, because they don't have that larger understanding and, and capacity to understand others. Right, and expecting them to speak my language and exactly. the translation from their language to our language, words don't always match. Some of the native tongues don't have any words for war. Because they don't have the concept. Right. Right. So like there was the, there was no word for chakra in English because the concept was not a Western European thing. Right. Until they became aware of it. Right. And then they say, well, we need a word for this. Well, what's our word for it? Chakra. We'll use yours. So actually English did, you know, absorbed all that. So sure. say what you want about colonialism and, you know, and there's a lot of not good things to say about it. English has evolved to have all these different words that allow us multiple shades of meaning for things. But anyway, I digress. So anyway, that, that's what not I Not always. It's all about communication. It's the words we use and the intentions we have behind them. Yes, sir. Yeah. So anyway, that's. That was uh, some of the, um, you know, uh, the, the awareness that I got when I was in Tanzania. Now I hope to get to Morocco where we have another tree planting organization and we're interviewing one uh, that's in Iceland and hopefully in Indonesia. And, but again, wherever you go, it's just sort of sit back and just watch people. And most people as they go about their day, maybe are a little bored. <laughs> You know, maybe you're a little bit bored with it because that's, it's normal for them. So you sort of maybe channel, you know, the, what, what's, try to see everything through their eyes and, you know, sure. uh, how do they, how do they live their life and what's normal for them. And, and then, now, do you find boredom um, precipitates complacency? Um, I don't know. Uh, could be, uh, but also maybe, uh, uh, maybe there's different types of boredom. boredom. Uh, oh, sure, there are. <laughs> yeah. Again, that's an English word with multiple meanings. It, it could. Uh, there are interpretations depending on the the situation, the environment that you're in. Yeah, it, it could. Um, it could, and you know, um, yeah, and I think routine certainly, you know, uh, precipitates complacency. I mean, the whole COVID thing that you were talking about um, was an issue. It would totally upset the apple cart, and I think a lot of people were like, "Hey, what the heck am I doing?" And why? And that's why you see the great re resignation or the great reshift or whatever the heck they're calling it. Right. I like to call it a wonderful um, statement. My friend, or a friend of mine, made uh, known as Swami Beyond Ananda. He's yeah. a new age comedian that's been doing it for forty years. He actually, uh, his name's Steve Berman. He wrote a book with Bruce Lipton called Spontaneous Evolution. Uh -huh. He calls it the great we set. We set. We set. Okay. Right, because we're all engaged. Right. This is something we're all involved with. It was a global event. There's an upwising that occurred because we're thinking deeper now about who we are, what we are, what we believe in, how we believe in, what we're going to do about it. Some people are. Enough. 
right? You and I are talking as a result of that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, live and let live. The global peace movement was a result of that because yeah. there needs to be another way. We need to figure out what we're doing to that allows mm -hmm. us to anybody, whether it's government or an individual across the board, to be aggressive towards anyone or anything. It's just unnecessary. It's not um, natural, right? And, and when you get to back to that empathic resonance, it isn't natural for somebody to go grass on another. That's a choice that, that's made out of some other thing than the empathic resonance that's natural between people. Here's, here's the thing. I don't know if, it, if, if violence is natural or unnatural. I really don't. I mean, I, this is one of my small R regrets is not studying anthropology enough and watching it. Hmm. But if you look at the human evolution, you know, started say, you know, three million years ago, um, for the vast majority of the time, we had to live in um, tribes. And they couldn't Hunter be gatherers big. And, and small tribal communities. Could not be big. Right. right. And what you and then what evolved? You know the limbic brain that's you know fight, flight, or fright. Okay, yeah. and obviously, or you've got what I want, so I'm going to come take it. Exactly. So and and that's what was happening. So people who did not look like you, chances are, were from another tribe or a separate subspecies, mm -hmm. because you know right now we're all kind of Homo sapiens, or so we claim. But you know, for how many millions of years were there multiple variations of? The genus homo you know you had you know the neanderthals and afrikansas you know and all this kind of stuff right and the people that did not like you the good chances were they were there for your food or for your women to your your your, your uh, child bearing women that's what they were for and the people that fought and won won so you know just the natural thing of that now along comes quote civilization and by that i mean cities you know a lot of people talk about what what it means to be civilized I and mean, you know people having to live together in a set place and work together on the irrigation on the food on the agriculture on building the structures and people who are good at making bricks or people who are good at making cloth or people who are good at making you know wood tools or people who are good at making uh now their systems applied into divisions of labor exactly and that's totally that's a total systemic you know you're looking at all that that's exactly what that is so these people maybe they were a separate tribe but they knew how to make metal tools so we had to kind of get along with them and after a few generations you know your grandson you know is looking at the, their granddaughter and they're kind of hook up and then you know then that's fine and you get right. the run you know the capulets and the montagues going so this but i'm saying the civilization if you look at the arc of human evolution is new and oh, absolutely and and it's you know not only this planet it, we can imagine that there are others just like us and and their evolutionary process which is a process right takes yes. hundreds of thousands of years yes sir if not longer and, and so there are periods of certain behaviors that then evolve into better behaviors and then there's some stragglers that have remained in, in our time now that are still in the, oh, I, you got what I want, so I'm going to come take it from you for, you know, in whatever way I can. Right. And that's where in our day and time, that's just not natural anymore. What's natural is that how do we work together to create what we need? I'm going to push that back on that. I think, you know, what okay. nature, what nature is nature and it takes a long time to change. Oh, I, right. yeah, and absolutely so it's, agree it's with not, that. What I would say is, is that it, it's not socially necessary. It's not necessary for survival, okay? But it's still there. And here is what I think maybe would bridge the gap. Yeah. You know, and as a liberal guy, and I mean by liberalism is, a, is, a, is an adjective or an adverb, or I, I go about it's not an adjective it's an, adjective. an open it's mind a, let's just put it that think way. about things you know yeah and um castigating people for having violent tendencies innately is not constructive because that they're going to be there what is is not controlling them right, right? being or learning how to redirect or make use of them in some way that has positive results exactly and that is exactly one of the reasons that Forest Planet exists. Because when I went to um, Ireland, that was in 2015, 
and I was starting to apply for grants and I wasn't thinking about it. And then 2016 came along and then we knew what happened in the presidential election in 2016, which I will just go ahead and tell, tell you and, and share that I was infuriated by that. It, not, it didn't make me sad, it made me angry. And it's like, okay, what are you gonna, I'm either gonna do somebody harm or I gotta channel this into something positive so I don't effing kill somebody. Cause well, I wasn't am. that the state of Americans at that point. They were tired of what had been happening. Here's somebody with new promising new stuff and ultimately got the vote, right? And in some ways, it may have been a, at least a wake up to, okay, we need, we need to head a different direction. That's a silver uh, lining that I, I, I would repeat to myself constantly, but I think sort of getting some of the, making some of the, uh, the demarcations clear uh, uh, were, um, is another benefit, uh, you know, as another silver lining to that time. But then right. I was able to, but, you know, literally in January of 2017, not two months later is when I incorporated Forest Planet and started throwing my passion into that. Well, good for um, you, and, and here's what I would like to draw attention to. Yes, and sir. This is a primary uh, activity in eliminating the distractions and doing something that is of service, right? Because the, the whole presidential, even now, the, the, I was watching the president or the um, U.S. Senate debate, our, our founder for Live and Let Live is running for U.S. Senate in Arizona. And the way the debate was handled and the way the, the Republican and Democrat acted towards each other, especially the Republican, was just ridiculous, right? And yet here we still have it. Yeah. it, it obviously, if, if people are acting like that in public, what are they doing in private? And so we need to be civil, which is the, Mark Victor is his name. This is what he brought out. You know, what, what happened to civility, right? And he, by example, noted some positive things about both of the others and what they were saying. He took no part in the mudslinging. Yep. And we have to move that direction. And we got a horrible example of it in the president that we ended up with, right? And all the the people and places and things he made fun of and, and just the ridiculous kind of statements that he would make. Um, it's like we're sanity, right? And, and, um, and that being said, now we're able to, okay, this is what COVID, the silver lining, got us to, okay, what's really important for me? And it got each one of us to look at what's important for us. Hopefully. Not all of us, but... <laughs> yeah. But enough, right? Yeah. You did it. You're doing this. It's having a huge impact. There are others who have formed organizations and things like that that are maybe not having huge impact yet. However, there's networks of hundreds of people and some thousands of people that yeah. are growing daily to affect change positively. And they all have, it seems, a, a similar mission in getting people, places, and things to get along. Yeah. Better. And, yes. and work together to create some kind of harmony. Now, harmony, you know, we hear harmony, we, we want to equate it with bliss. It's the management of chaos. Chaos is just patterns we don't recognize yet. Yep. Right? So as we peel back the layers and we stay in that place of um, viewing, observing, asking questions, and allowing it to unpack itself by the questions we ask, and this is the engineering side of things, right? How's that work? <laughs> Right? And what can we do to make it better? Yep. Yeah. Agreed. So how does this, how, how are you being able to inspire those around you to do similar things? And what kind of growth are you seeing in their character as a result? You're asking me how I'm, inspiring other people to start their own organizations you know that or we're even working within yours it, it could be both right um so, yeah i, I i'm sorry I'm, I'm so like i have to be 110 percent focused on you know this so I've, I've got a little bit of blinders so i can only speak intelligently about people that i interact with well that's that's the main uh, yeah. that's, uh, that's 
who you interact with, right? You, interact you, with you've got the big picture view, but that's a, a, you know, you're looking at the horizon, what's right in front of your face and how is it responding and how are you inspiring them to respond? So, um, you know, there's, there's different people um, because I look, you know, the system as it is, as I should, you know, the, 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 the center of the, of, the, of the spider web, if you will, there's a lot of you know, tentacles that go all the way around. I mean, we have individuals who um, are, are very interested in what we're doing and we, you know, accept their donations and that's great. Uh, small dollar, large dollar um, businesses. And those are very interested to talk, interested because you need, when you're talking to businesses, there's two things. There's the business, which is a thing. And then there's people who work at the business who are humans and have desires and whatever. And it's really about triangulating and, you know, making something for everyone, so to speak. You can't sure. just... Now, is that kind of where, and, and I would classify you as a B Corp? Um, right? So uh, we're a 501c3, and I will talk to B Corp organizations, um, but I am the connector. And okay. to be a good connector, I, and I always describe to be, is really what are other people's motivations? What right. floats their boat? What gets them going? Where are their pain points? Where are their pressure points? What's their life? What's their life like and how are you can be there to help solve a yeah, problem? I misspoke on that. I, I would look at the businesses that you are dealing with that some of them may be B Corps. And, sure. Right. There's a 501c3, which is what Live Not Live is as well. Sure. Uh, that's so, a different breed. It, it is. Um, so actually, but where I, I need, but the B Corps, I think already get it by definition. I mean, you, you know, you've got to jump through so many hoops to get to B Corps. I found that when I talk to B Corps about working with me, I, I really kind of get the cold shoulder a little bit because they say, well, we're already doing stuff like that. We don't really need to check that sustainability box. We don't have to plant a tree with every product we sell because baked into that product is all this good stuff that we're already doing. And mm -hmm. fair enough. It's not really going to buy them that much more brand awareness, if you will. Right. More credibility in the marketplace. More credibility in the marketplace and, and all that. Right. So, so my conversations are with like pizza joints, you know, um, a little more, if you will, mainstream, you know, like a, like a, like a, like a restaurant chain or someone selling electronics online or someone selling uh, office supplies or believe it or not, uh, spirits and strong waters. Like there's a new vodka brand that's coming out and it's got, it's infused with, you know, healthy things. And it actually tastes pretty good. If, if you like vodka, I don't drink, so I have to trust everybody else. Yeah, but they plant a tree with every bottle. So that's how they can differentiate. Yeah. You go to any liquor store and you ask for the vodka rack, how many brands you've got? Dozens. So they can, so they can differentiate themselves for not much money and, they're kind of getting it that it's not just more so the business like the you know the, the p and l the, the the business thing the the, the non-human entity part of it likes it because it gets the mind share but then the human beings that work there you know it gives them something that okay yeah we're we're selling vodka we're doing this and we're doing that but we're getting trees planted you know and we like that and right. the customers that we i mean i just gave a shout out to one organization that has you know cbd tinctures and oils uh, there's a lot of people doing that and it's all very good stuff and it's very anti-inflammatory there's a long line of benefits there. how do you right. differentiate well i mean these are 50 60 dollar bottles of stuff this isn't you know they're not making these by the gallon and you know right. they, and, and it costs much more to because of the hoops that they have to jump through in, in order to get the products to begin with uh, especially with the federal laws still in exactly. place regarding hemp and, and cannabis and, and all that kind of it stuff. Is, it is, it is, you know, it's, it, it kind it, of seems a bit ridiculous now in this day and age, doesn't it? I, I you know, again, I, I, it makes sense to me. I think plant-based things are, 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 are very good. I mean, we evolved with plants and plants have evolved to um, be very good at um, defending themselves. So when right. you're talking about essential oils of, you know, pick, pick any plant, uh, the number one thing that they are is, is you know, they, they repair the thing and they're, they're very good with uh, punching down inflammation in human bodies, which is actually the, the root of a lot of different eating. Absolutely. And, and yet it's the disease that's caused by the stress, you know, because we're not doing the right things and, and exactly. see yeah. the lives around us. and It's uh, exacerbated. And, so and, just to finish that, I mean, the, yeah. that one, all we did was just did a, give a little shout out to the one CBD group that we work with. 
on our webpage, and they've planted about 8,000 trees with us so far, and you know, um, that's fine. That's 8,000 more than most of the other brands. Well, I mean, our webpage exploded. You know, people really like that. They're gonna recommend, uh, hopefully they'll, well, they may or they may not re remem remember that when it comes to time for them to do that, or they just like the concept of it. So, yeah, again, it's about the individuals and, um, you know, maybe lights going off. And then also that it's not just about carbon. That's a whole discussion. Yeah, you're going to sure. cool the planet. You're going to sequester mm -hmm. carbon. But it's about the soil and it's about the water and it's about livelihoods of people. And mm -hmm. that's where you see the, you know, the lights go off and the eyebrows go up. And I love that when they say, oh, there's a lot more to this than just carbon. I go, yes. Yeah. Speaking of more. Yes. Are there specific types of trees that you plant? Or do you look at the bioregion and, and plant deciduous trees um, or introduce new species? Or, you know, one thing I'm thinking of, I, I was introduced to the polonia tree yeah. some years ago. It's phenomenal. You know, fastest growing tree on the planet. It's natural hardwood. You don't have to put in a kiln. Um, and the leaves are like velvety, you know, elephant ears <laughs> and beautiful purple flowers on, the, on these trees. And, and yet yeah, they take a lot of high, or a lot of water and, and they will grow in high desert areas. So that kind of limits their, um, the region, so to yep. speak. Do you pay attention to the different types of trees and, and what's appropriate for the areas? Absolutely. Number one, you have to. And the good news is that that's not my problem either. So for example, in Usambara, uh, those people have a, 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 a nursery uh, with any, at any given time, 12 to 15 million seedlings representing dozens and dozens of species, seeds of which came from just the surrounding areas. Right. right? So when I was there in June, I saw four different areas and there's different blog posts on my website about all this, but in each area, there was a different biome. There was different levels of water. The soil was different. We planted different trees for different agendas. Okay, Which, and that's was their that was their decision, not mine. Right. And I again to your to your point earlier is is that okay, I might not understand this, but I asked a whole lot of questions, but they had good answers. Sure. And, they, sure. and, and, and the best thing is they had. Results. And you had the empathic resonance. Yeah. Uh, they, they, right. they, I can see the results and I can yeah, see. Yeah. Another way of looking at that is uh, truth resonates when you share it. Right? Truth, yes. It, it, if you, if you listen for it and you realize that you walk in like, yeah, I'm not the expert here. Right. You're well, we're talking about indigenous, you know, the, it's that gut feeling. It's that first brain activity, which you're yeah. probably familiar with, where it, you just connect with it and it, it rings true. Right. right. And um, it made sense and I could see it. So, sure. So, I mean, I've stood on a hill that overlooked 40 hectares, which is about 100 football fields, full of 80,000 trees that we helped plant. And that was probably one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my entire life, you know, sounds, yeah, because it, cool. it, it was really, it, it just really changed everything. Now, are there ratios that you've found? I don't know how far you've dug into the, the numbers of, you know, what are the ratios as far as the number of trees of each kind of variety exactly. that are planted yeah, in no, that, that's, 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 that's the magic, that, again, that these guys have. Okay. That, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Like, in one area, it's like, oh, we're only going to do use, like, maybe three or four species tops, and we're going to space them in such and such a way, and we're only going to outplant them until the seedlings for each, each um, species are three, six, nine, 12 inches or whatever. And you have to do it right at the beginning of the rainy season. And you have to just check all these boxes. No one's just wandering around throwing seeds in. Oh yeah, yeah. It, well, it, there's a science. There's a total science and it's back and forth and it's trial and error to do this. So they'll do that in one planting site, knowing that actually eventually that really was about stabilizing soil and breaking up hard pan and just getting the soil going, knowing that probably within 20 years, this is th that particular area was completely surrounded by a forest reserve, which had dozens of species in it, right? Mm -hmm. But probably within you know a couple of decades, the birds and the mammals and the you know, little you know the ground whatever will bring seeds in and they will encroach on that, and that one section that we revitalize will hopefully be indistinguishable to you know by the to, to the rest of the fo forest. But we moved over to a water resource area where it was really about planting a whole lot of trees that grew fast, grew straight, 
and you could plant them very closely together, very densely to capture the rainwater during the rainy season and mm -hmm. channel it into the aquifers because the whole well for this whole community was drying up, right? And when that happens, we're talking a couple thousand people, right? And right. when the wells dry up and the water goes away, then you've got refugees. They can't stay there, of course. Yeah. So and we uh, have that same thing happening in the States, uh, the Hopi reservation. Um, they had the, uh, uh, I don't know how many springs I know of one in particular that used to feed several fields and yeah. it's dried up, you know, and, and a yeah. lot of this, the, this has been attributed to the energy companies that are coming in with the mining operations and taking the water from the aquifers and using it for, you know, their purposes. Think, and, and it just, it doesn't make sense. And yet, you know, industry gets away with a lot of things it, that it does. shouldn't. It does. Uh, so those, that's part of the aggression I'm talking about, right? It, it, with the, how do we redesign things? How do we remove aggressive activity and put things into uh, the perspectives of, of simply being good humans, yeah, right? right? Being conscious and, and thoughtful and mindful of what, not just what we're doing, but how we're doing it. Yes, sir. Now, speaking of how we're doing it, how do you see this process and, and others like it um, in the next 5, 10, 15 years, what kind of effects do you hope to have as a result? So um, what I hope to have is um, more planting sites. So, I mean, again, back to Tanzania, I just saw four planting sites that we had completed that were mm -hmm. done, but I saw dozens and dozens of more potential sites all right so again just in tanzania you're talking a billion trees with a b that could be put back right so um what i'm i'm hoping for is a continuation of the momentum where people kind of get it that yeah it's a small marble but also there are solutions sure. so um I, I i hope that not a whole lot of people have sort of, you know, given to, to despair on this and like, Hey, we're just gonna, you know, uh, have a break party and we're trashed, excuse me. And, you know, we're done. There's this, it's, 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 it's all hopeless. And I guess one of the things that you know, part of one of our, uh, little, uh, logos is, you know, plant trees, plant hope, right? Because with, with the trees, it's, it's inexpensive and it's fast and it's effective. Right. Right. And if I can sort of just communicate that those three things, like, okay, you know, it's easy to give in, but you don't really want to, you know, you don't want to, all right, for the sake of your kids, for the sake of everything, you know, you're just sort of talking smack here. So, but I got good news for you. It's, it's inexpensive and it's fast and it works. And hopefully I, you know, there you go, uh, will be able to sort of, you know, get uh, with, you know, with the assistance of good people like yourself and get the word out you know, on as many podcasts as possible. So I'm not the only guy screaming in the room. I'm not yes. the only one saying this. And that's oh, I, I totally, absolutely you're not. And yet yeah. many voices is one. Yeah, otherwise we're definitely in a mess. Because yeah, yeah. if I'm the only one, then forget it. <laughs> right, now let's talk about disparity, right? So speaking of despair, do you find that the land is in a state of despair or has it been human... Um, misjudgment of land use like for instance the clear cutting of trees in the amazon yeah all the above okay so it, it's like so the one place with the uh with the eighty thousand trees we call that quasi planting site uh that's a combination of fire due to climate change uh and short-term uh farming practices people coming in and now that the forest is burned down i'll just clear out this area and i'll plant this thing that shouldn't be here and it doesn't really help and it extracts from the soil rather than replenishes it so it's usually all the above that, you know, the why, how did it get here? Um, and then you got to, you know, look at all those, well, well, how can we keep that from happening again? Right. And one of the things is, okay, what about that human encroachment on, you know, cutting down trees? And, you know, is that a corporation or are that a bunch of small uh, farmers who are desperate to feed their family? And need sure. More land? Or how can you plan for the future and building supplies if we continue to use wood for, buildings paper you know all kinds of things um and can that be included in the infrastructure and the build out or grow up 
on these areas. Well, it, 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 I'm glad you brought that up because um, the uh, Rente project uh, is a bigger project that's in Tanzania where we were, and it had three different pieces of it. But the first piece was to bring small seedlings, healthy seedlings to members of a community because they all have small farms like right in their backyard on these hills, right. right? So we brought them avocados that had been grafted which means that they are going to produce nutritious fruit within two or three years, as opposed to five or six, mm. right? Um, now, and we're talking like a thousand of them per year per tree. And these people were patient enough and recognized that uh, they know what was coming because with those avocados, they consume maybe 20, 30% for their family, very rich in nutrients. You know, it's about nourishing their family, nourishing the community, but right. the rest can be sold into markets. There's a huge demand and all these other things. So it was really about providing some level of economic stability to the people who otherwise might encroach upon the forest and degrade it for short-term capital gain. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. It and, does. And then, and then some of the trees that we gave them were fast growing and tall pines, which after 10 years, they will cut down, but they will put it into their house. So the carbon is still in there. It's still sequestered, but they will be basically growing their own floorboards and roof beams and whatever, rather than going into the forest and doing all this. So giving these um, communities um, the trees, now they do all the work, you know, because here are the seedlings ready to go and they knew what to do with them and they were all planted. And I met a, a bunch of these people who lived in this very lovely people lived in this small community, no running water, very few had electricity but everybody had a phone. Uh, isn't that amazing? You know, the, what is it? Uh, 1.4 billion people in Africa and over five or around 500 million make less than a dollar a day. Exactly. But, but that's okay in their economy. It right? seemed, well, depends on their commodity. Yeah, it, 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 it depends. Right. But it it, totally, it, totally depends. It's not as bad as what it sounds. It, it, it's not as bad as what it sounds. So for example, you know, we planted, you know, that, that, that spring where we planted like 68,000 trees, but we also planted almost 170,000 trees up the mountainside further up the hill, right? So I wanted to go see them. Well, I mean, we had to hike up maybe like a, a, a 40 degree incline that was tilted and wet. And yes, I fell off. And yes, I got my leg all cut up. And I've never been so proud of a, of a scar in my life. To get up to this hillside to see where the trees were planted, that's another story. There's amazing photos from up there. Sure. But there's no one, but how did you get 168,000 seedlings up here? Oh, we hired the villagers. And they carry, you know, 100 at a time, maybe four, five, six times per day. Now, at the end of the day, they each got 10,000 Tanzanian shillings, which is good money for them. Okay? Good money for that account. And they were happy to get it. Now, that's $4.20 hmm. a day, right? So, that's, so, yeah, that's, that's higher than the mean. And you're incorporating a social enterprise. Exactly. And they were very happy to do it. And they knew that those trees up there were about hanging onto the water. And then within four or five years, and they were okay with that timeline, the, the root systems would be deep enough that it would hang on to, they would start hanging on to the, cool. uh, the, the, well, the, the annual rainfall and their wells would come back. So they got the memo. Speaking of holding on and then we're kind of running out of time. Sir. Absolutely amazing stories you have and, and really yeah. relevant for today's world and, and what we can do in it that many may not even be aware of. Yep. And I hopefully that this will provide that awareness to a greater degree. So let's pull it back in just a little bit. In the advent of an opportunity or, or just in life in general, as we proceed, what kind of advice would you give to those who are looking, seeking, questioning what's going on and, and how to move forward to the best of their ability in it? I know that's a tough question. But I, you've got to really you're that. right. That's a tough question. I, I, I guess I just, I don't really, I'm going to think about 20 things, of, you know, later tonight that I should have said, but. Um, what's on the mind? What's your gut response to that? I, I, you know, 
I, 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 I honestly, I'm sorry, I don't know how to answer it because it's going to be different for everybody. Okay. And I, but I think there are some universals in terms of fulfillment, you know, figure Good. out. That's where I'm getting that. That's where I want you to go. What is it truly that personally fulfills you as an individual and how does, and, and where, do, where's the D mark? Where's that interface with the rest of the planet? Okay. Perfect. And, you know, so, because some people are like, oh, what fulfills me is doing all the, you know, eating Twinkies all day long. You know, it really does. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's going to trash the joint, right? It, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's not good. So try to find that overlap for fulfillment uh, on all levels and something that is, you know, good for your environment, for your little blue marble, because we only have one, yeah. right? That's, yeah. if, if I could, if, uh, hopefully that. And if you, eat, and if, you know, it's not a Lay's, you can't just eat one because if you eat one, it's gone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, Hank, it's been a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I know it went places that neither one of us knew it was going to go before we began, but that's the whole nature of conversation, right? And, and yes, getting to know each other and having conversations that matter and, and provide some apocalyptic moments for both of us and our audience. Hopefully. Hopefully. So, yes, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It was very enjoyable. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you again. And, and I'll follow up with some things for you as well. Namaste and in La Catch. And thanks for keeping up with us and sticking around for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and I will see you next time. <laughs>